It's our prayer that this message will be a blessing to you. May it be a source of strength and help for the struggle you may be facing today. Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless this one who may be listening to this message. Let your word be a light into their pathway as they go through their day and the week ahead. Bless them, Father, with all spiritual blessing. It's my prayer today. In Jesus' name. Now we take you to the service already in progress. God bless you. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my Spirit. Amen. Revive. It shall come to pass. In the last days, that I will pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit. That's a promise. I will pour out my spirit. Now, when God gets ready to do something, nobody can stop it. When God gets ready to fulfill his word, it will come to pass. And I'm persuaded of that. When it came time for Israel to leave, leave Egypt, there was nothing that could keep them there. Pharaoh couldn't keep them there. His armies couldn't keep them out, keep them there. Even the Israelites who might want to stay couldn't stay. It was time to go. It was God's time, and they left. When they left, God put the sea behind them, and they were sealed off from all retreats. The only place to go was the promised land. God has got a time. Now, revival came in the book of Acts. That was one more revival. One of the hardest cities in the world had revival. It was the hardest city in the world to have revival. Have you ever tried to reach a Jew? Have you ever had to try to have revival like right now in Jerusalem? It would be no easier now in Jerusalem to have revival than it was at the time of the book of Acts had it not been for the ministry of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. But they came to the hardest city in the world to have revival. The prophecy had been given that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, that he would send rain, the early rain, and the latter rain. This was the promise from God. And it came in one day. There was no church in the first chapter of Acts. But in the second chapter of Acts, there was a church. It was born in a moment, in a day. Can such a thing happen? It did happen. A hundred and twenty people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Their life was changed. From that it went on. There were 3,000, and then there were 4,000. And every little village around Jerusalem, in every house in the city, and in every village, every house in the city and the village received the message of truth. They received the witness. God began to move. By the third chapter of Acts, Peter and John goes up to the temple, and the lame man is begging for alms. He's not asking to be healed. He said, I want something to eat on. Would you give me just a few pennies? Peter said, silver and gold. We don't have any. 
but such as I have, give I unto thee. He did not anoint with oil. He did not lay hands on the man. But something had been given to him. Not only had the Holy Ghost come, but there was a measure of faith that had been brought to this disciple's heart. And he said, what I have got, I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. There were miracles that accompanied that revival. God moved in particular places and in peculiar ways. By the fourth chapter of Acts, the persecution had started. They were being persecuted. They had been called into the council. They had been warned not to teach or preach in this name. They went back to prayer. Prayer was the motivating factor. Prayer was the fuel that ran the motor. They said, God, give us boldness to speak thy word. And when they prayed, the Bible says the place was shaken where they prayed. That old building shook. God was saying, I'm here. I heard you. God doesn't always speak in an audible voice. In fact, most of the time, he doesn't. He wants us to stand on his word. He wants us to believe what's recorded in this book. If we'll believe what's in this book, and we'll stand on the word of God, he will do what he said he will do. By the time you get to the fifth chapter, you've got Ananias and Sapphira. And they went on, went on in on the blessing, but they don't want to pay the price. They have come and they have brought just a portion of what they said they had sold the property for. And uh, in this portion, they brought it and laid it before Peter on an individual basis. And Peter said, uh, the man that carried your spouse out is going to carry you out. And uh, they, one at a time, they had dropped dead and they carried them out and buried them. There was great fear because not only did revival come, but judgment came. I don't know sometimes if we really know what we're asking for when we ask for revival. But we are asking for a revolution. We're asking for an about turn. We're talking about a total change from what we are. We are so geared to regulation, and we're so geared to certain things, and we're go so geared to putting God in just little specific places in our life. But the revival that God wants to send to this church would be a revival that consumes us, that consumes our time, that consumes our thinking, that takes over everything, and we become just a little cog in the big wheel that God has turning. Hallelujah. And with that will come judgment. Revival came and judgment came. When judgment came, great fear came upon the people. And they said, hey, he's not only a glorious God, he is an awful God. He's full of, oh, he's full of wonder. And in the seventh chapter, you've got Stephen Stone. And they said, yeah, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to stop the church. But when they stoned Stephen, it was a victorious exit and not an exit of defeat. When he left this earth, he left with the glory of God upon him. And he left a witness behind that says, this, this salvation is good enough to live for. And it's also good enough to die for. I don't know in North America if anybody has been called to give their life for the gospel in the last few years. I doubt it. I know of no records. But I do believe this. In the revival that God moves in, there will be miracles, but there also will be sacrifice. Sacrifice like we have never done before. Like our minds have never conceived before. We are so small in comparison to the numbers of North America and the world. If we took all of the church of the United Pentecostal Church and put it on foreign soil, we still wouldn't have enough preachers if every Christian was a preacher. We've got to expand our minds. We've got to expand our thinking. We've got to expand our fight, our faith to say, God, let us understand more about what you're trying to do. There was a revival in Samaria. 
They went down, and Philip went down, and he preached the name. Jesus had been there some time before. He put the seeds of revival in the heart of a little old harlot. And when Philip came down and he preached the name, that name of Jesus, demons started to cry out. People repented. They were baptized. And when Peter and John came down and laid hands on them, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Revival spread. I don't think there's ever been a generation that had more ability, if we can get in God's vein of thinking, if we can get in that measure of faith, we can bring our life to that place of sacrifice. There has never been a people who know more about the total aspect of the Word of God, who have more talents, more abilities, and more money than any generation that ever lived on the earth. I believe it. And yet... Unless we walk with God in sensitivity, He will pass us by and find somebody else to do what He wants to do. In that revival in Samaria, while it was going on so great, God called Philip away out in the desert. He did not want them to forget about the individual. But I, I heard Brother Gidrose, Brother V.A. Gidrose say that when uh, he did some traveling, I believe when he went to Ethiopia, and he said, in the archives of Ethiopia, there is a record that they baptized in Jesus' name. It goes back to the time and the date when that eunuch that Philip baptized, that went on his way rejoicing, the Holy Ghost is a joy. He doesn't say it, but I know he got it. There was no reason he couldn't have it. He went on his way rejoicing, and there in the archives of Ethiopia, it tells they baptized in Jesus' name. There was a revival that broke out in that country. And then it happened in the Gentiles, Cornelius' household. Peter went down, and while he was speaking to them, probably with much doubt, and God had given to him the vision for the four-cornered sheep with all manner of unclean beasts, and saying, Peter, rise, slay, and eat. And in indignation, he drew back until God said, What I've cleansed, don't call unclean. There are things that we may not have given ourselves to that revival will require. There will be a brotherly love that binds us like nothing ever has. Let me say to you tonight, there has never been a time when we needed each other more than we need each other now. I need to in what I'm trying to do for God. You need your brother and your sister in what you're trying to do for God. We will never accomplish anything great for God just alone. Praise God. There have been awakenings. There have been awakenings. Now let me let me kind of clarify something here. There is there is evangelism, and that's where we are. We're doing evangelism. We're doing Sunday school evangelism. We're doing youth evangelism. We're doing home missions evangelism. We've got conferences on growth and evangelism. Uh, Brother Mitchell will be preaching on evangelism tomorrow to the children, and I'm preaching about uh, revival tonight. But evangelism is where we go out and we invite people to come in. We sow seeds of the gospel in their hearts. But when there is really a revival that amounts to an outpouring, the evangelism, we ask people to repent of their sins. But in real revival, they cry out to God to forgive them of their sins. They are convicted and they want God to separate them from their sins. In that part we have not come to yet. There was an awakening in the time of Hezekiah in the Old Testament. One of the most adverse situations. And I'm trying to show you by example tonight what God can do if we work with Him. He will never give us what we want, just us waiting. You know, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But that word wait actually means entwine. It's like a little thread that's wrapped around a cable, and we are that thread. It's more than just us waiting. It's us are in our involvement with God. Now, Hezekiah came on the throne when he was about 25 years old, and he followed 16 years of wicked Ahaz's reign, and there was idols everywhere. Everywhere you want to look, there was an idol. 
The Israelites were passing their children through the fire. They were burning their children at the altar unto Moloch. It was an abomination and a stench in the nostrils of God. The temple was in ruins. The altar was forsaken. The light had gone out in the candlesticks. There was no fire on the brazen altar. The priests were not ministering. There was nobody in the courtyard. The spiders and the bats had taken over the tabernacle or the temple there. But Hezekiah came to the throne and he said, We are going to keep the feast of Passover. They looked at him like he was crazy. They hadn't had a feast of Passover for many, many years. The wicked kings had reigned upon the throne, and they'd forgotten the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they'd forgotten the Word of God, and they were just all doing their own thing. Out there under the trees, in the, with their idols of the groves, and their gods, uh, their pagan gods that they worship. But Hezekiah said, we are going to have a revival. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to clean up that temple. And he got men together and he started them into the temple. They went inside that house of God and they began to clean up the sanctuary. They began to clean up the holy place. They began to rebuild the altar. They relighted the candlesticks. They put fire back on the brazen altar. They began to search for the lineage of the priests and the Levites. And they said, you are going to need to minister again in the house of God. And so they came together, and he sent out the word, and he said, we're going to keep the feast of Passover. But when he sent it up to the northern kingdom, they laughed at him. They said there's no way that he can ever keep the feast of Passover. And so they worked toward it. They built uh, uh, their altars, and they got their priests as ready as they could. They got the Levites ready. But when it came time to offer the sacrifice and to have that feast of Passover, it was one week late. One week late. Never had it ever been done before. They couldn't have it one week late. But Hezekiah turns his face toward God. And he said, God, I want to keep the feast of Passover. We've worked at it as hard as we could. We've planned for it all this time. The priests aren't ready. The Levites aren't ready. That time of cleansing has not been fulfilled. Everything says we can't do it. But God, would you let us keep that feast of Passover this year? It's in my heart. In the beginning of that chapter, 2 Kings 30th chapter, he said, or 2 Chronicles 30th chapter, he said, it is in my heart to make a covenant with my God. He began to talk to God, and God spoke to him. And he said, Hezekiah, go ahead and offer your feast. He said, I will cleanse the priests and the Levites. I will give them a dispensation. I'll go beyond that. I'll heal the sick that come there and offer those sacrifices. The priests were cleansed. The Levites were cleansed. The offerings were given. They played music like hadn't been heard in the temple for many, many years. They shouted before God. They danced before God. They sang praises to Him. The Bible said the joy like they had there at that feast of Passover had not been heard in Jerusalem since the time of David. That the sound of it went up to heaven. It was so great in their worship to God. Hallelujah. They couldn't do it, but they did. I'm talking about what we can do. There are certain things that not only can we do, we must do. We must do. We must have evangelism. We must have outreach. We must run buses and teach Bible studies. We must do the work of God. But when we have done all that we have done, then there comes that divine unction from on high. There comes that special dispensation of the Spirit. Amen. That sovereign act of God. And that's what we've got to have. Hallelujah. Revival. Awakenings. Ezra had an awakening. You see, they, they went back to Jerusalem. Let me show you again that when God's time is right, nothing's going to stop it. God said, 70 years are, are determined upon your people to bring in an everlasting righteousness. 
And so for 70 years, Daniel knew it. That's why he was praying there. And in the latter part of that book of Daniel, he knew the time was up. Ezra was about to go back. In fact, Nehemiah went back first. He took 50,000 people with him. Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and others, 50,000 Jews went back to rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. God said, 70 years are determined. And when the 70 years were up, it did come to pass. Nobody could stop it. Cyrus couldn't stop it. Nebuchadnezzar was dead. Nobody, Arctic Xerxes even let uh, Ezra and Nehemiah go. And after Nehemiah went, here comes Ezra. And Nehemiah was the builder, but Ezra was the preacher. And he looks around and he says, we've got to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We've got to remember that we, we're just strangers and pilgrims. Go back to your tents and, and your booths and let's get down in the dust and let's talk to God. He said, we've been a long time where a lot of pride and a lot of idols and a lot of other things was. Let's get back in touch with God. Let's keep the Feast of Tabernacles. He started to preach. And I love that part of Ezra where it says he read the Word of God and they sat in the streets. Now, you think this was an awakening. They sat in the streets, the cold stone streets, and it rained all day long while Ezra read the Word of God. And they sat in the rain, the long, cold rain, because they wanted to hear the Word of God. When he got done reading that Word, it didn't bless them. They didn't shout. They didn't run. Because that Word said, put away your strange wives. They had children by these strange wives. But they listened and they said what God's Word has said. They wept. And they confess their sin. Oh, God, that a spirit of weeping get us. Help us to confess our weaknesses, faults, and sins. And do the Word of God. Praise God. If one can put a thousand and two can put ten thousand, what can a multitude do who want to have revival? Always people looking. Simeon and Anna there in the temple. And Simeon had been told, you're not going to depart until you've seen the Lord's Christ. And here's that old prophetess Anna, and she's fasting and praying and lives in the temple. And the day when the Redeemer came in, she was there, and she was rejoicing for this little babe in arms. But old Simeon took that little babe and said, oh... This one is set for the rising and the falling of many in Israel. Oh, now, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace, for I have seen the consolation of Israel. I'm ready to go. I have seen what I want to see. And when John the Baptist preached, see, that was before the time of Christ. Six months before he ever came to minister, when John the Baptist preached, they had an awakening. People came to get baptized. Four hundred years a prophet hadn't been heard. And the last prophet to be heard, they hardly listened to it. The last several prophets to be heard, they hardly listened to it. But here comes a man from nowhere. He hardly is known. He's been in the wilderness. He's crude. He's rough. But friend, he was in time with God. And when he preached, conviction took hold of people. They Pray, they cried, they repented, they were baptized. What I'm saying is, there is a time. There is a time. I want to be in that time. He said, I'll send the farmer and I'll send the latter rain. Now notice what God said there in Joel. He said, your floors are going to be full of wheat. The vats are going to be full of wine. I'm going to restore the years that the locusts. The caterpillar, the canker worm, I'm going to restore them unto you. Brother Mitchell, I'm wondering if he's maybe saying to us, some of these children that are still alive, the caterpillar and the canker worm has gotten them, but I'm going to restore them to you. I'm going to restore them to you. Some of these parents are still praying and loving those children, asking God to save them before it's too late. Some of them strayed. Hey, it's taking its toll. It's taking its toll. But God said, I'm going to restore the years. I'm going to 
fill your vats with wine. I'm going to fill your floors with wheat. It's going to be a time of plenty. He's talking about revival. Hallelujah. James 5, 7 said the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and he had long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. I just recently learned that the latter rain is a spring rain. It's not a fall rain. It's a spring rain. But it's seven times greater than the early rain. Seven times greater. Oh, God. I watched a measure of revival that to me was the most exciting part of my ministry I'd ever known. When Bible studies started to work and people just one by one started to come and every service the altar was full and uh, the tank was never empty the water for two years because in almost every service we were baptizing somebody. But you know, that's just, that's just a smattering. That's just really a few raindrops. And we are not ready. We're really not ready for the revival that God wants to give. Because He's trying to build a base. You know what God's trying to do for us? He's trying to get us to build a base. That tree can't reach out any greater than what the roots can hold. It. Moses said, I would that all of God's children would prophesy. And God would like that everybody would place themselves at the disposal of God. That He can use them. That they could develop. That they could be a disciple. And in being a disciple, they can help to work with others when God starts to reach out to save the lost in this end time. Our churches will never hold. Buildings will never stop. But the Haney said that, and I've heard that before, and I've said it. The buildings that we think of will never hold a revival. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God, God, I want to know your time. And I want to be in on it. I don't want it to pass me by. I don't want it to pass me by. You know, I can get taken up with things just like you can too. A lot of things can occupy our mind. And this is a world of prosperity. And we may have gone through a recession, but we still drive automobiles. And I remember when we walked to church. I remember when we walked eight times a week when revival was on. And I was only five years old. The whole family walked. We not only didn't own a car, there was no car in sight for us. We live by measure in a great age of prosperity. And it's so easy to get caught up in life with jobs and monies and obligations and things that we buy. And people and societies and leadership and many, many other things. But oh, let our hearts go back to the rock. To say, God, break me if you must. <laughs> Whip me if you must. Chastise me if you must. But don't ignore me. And don't pass me by. When you bring about what you want to do in this earth, let me be in on it. Let me know the time of revival. In Luke, the 19th chapter, Jesus spoke. He said, there's going to come a time in Israel when your enemies are going to cast you around. They're going to put a trench around you. And said they're going to stay there until there's not one stone left upon another. Well, it didn't look like it was possible. Why, that's not possible. But it was possible. And it came to pass in 70 A.D. It was God's time. He told them about it. They didn't know just when it was. But the historians tell us that just before Titus came, there were strange happenings in Jerusalem. The great gates that took 20 men to open and shut would open of their own accord, maybe in the middle of the night. That at evening time, there would be chariots of fire and horses of fire that would race across the sunset. They didn't know what it meant. And then Titus came with his first launch of war, and he seized the city for just a short time, and he left the city and retreated. When he did, the historians tell us that the church moved out and headed for a hiding place. For Titus was coming back. It was his time. And when he laid that seed in 70 A.D., he said, don't touch the temple. 
It is a sacred landmark. Leave the stones together. That was the last commandment of Titus. But Jesus said, there won't be a stone left upon another. Titus camped around the city until the people inside Jerusalem starved to death. They ate leather soaked in water. They ate twigs off the tree. They boiled the dead bodies of babies. They fought each other like war for little tidbits of, uh, of nothing really of value to eat. And then there were those who would try to escape over the wall and into the darkness. And when the Roman soldiers caught them, they crucified them. And by the time the siege was over, historians tell us that the crosses with human beings hanging on them was so thick that you could hardly walk between them outside the walls. Then came the day when the gates were down and the Romans were inside the walls of Jerusalem. And the last place the Jews retreated to was the temple. So Titus had to attack the Jews in the temple. And in the process, the tapestries were set afire. The warfare went on. And before it was over, not only was it burned, but there was not one stone left upon another. Jesus Christ had said it would come to pass. When the time came, nothing was going to stop it. When the Alaskan earthquake occurred some years ago, when the black seer said, that big bay, that Anchorage Bay, by the city of Anchorage, they looked out in the bay and suddenly it was dry. Big ships come into that harbor, but they were not there and the bay was dry. All the water was sucked out into the ocean by that tidal wave. Somewhere beneath the earth's, earth's surface, down in the ocean, there had been an upheaval and a recession and had drawn the water out. When this happened, said the birds, hush, they quit singing, and the animals left the hot lowlands, and they headed for the hills. It was not very long until that water came back from the ocean. It was a mighty avalanche of a wave that washed everything and destroyed it that was in front of it. And then that earthquake took hold and began to shake, and sidewalks and buildings disappeared. But nature knew that something was happening. They felt the signs. God has signs, and He has times. We have got to know God's time. I'm not here to tell you that tomorrow is God's time, but this is the end time. If there is a revival, it's got to come pretty soon. And I don't want to be on a journey when it happens. I don't want to be in on it. Hallelujah. Hey, yeah, I made a prophecy. It's never, as far as I understand, it's never come to pass. They built that temple called the River Bell's Temple. That was after the 70 years and the 50,000 went back and then uh, Ezra went back with another 15,000. And they built the temple called Zerubbabel's Temple. And Haggai was the inspiration behind that. That old prophet said, it's not time to live in your sealed houses in the house of God lying away. He said, let's rise up and build. Go to the mountains and let's get wood. And they built that temple. And then he looked at it and he said, Said, you that have seen this temple in their first glory, does it look like nothing to you? Some of them wept because they had seen Solomon's temple. He said, it looks like it's not anything. But he said something that I'm standing on. He said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. Now, Zerubbabel's temple never was greater than Solomon's temple. The glory of that house never was. It could have been, but it wasn't. Never was greater than Solomon's temple. So that's got to come to pass. Hallelujah. The glory of the latter house. Whose glory? God's glory. When we forget who we are, forget our titles, forget our honors, and forget the accolades, and give glory to that name of Jesus. And know that He's everything and that we're nothing. That He can do anything. We can't do anything without Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
The Bible talks about the sons of Issachar said they knew what men ought to do. They had an understanding of the times. Give us the sensitivity of the sons of Issachar to know what we ought to do. What we ought to do now in preparation. And I know one thing we ought to do, and that's make a million disciples. A million disciples. Make disciples out of the people. Ministers, those people in your church, make disciples out of them. They've, some of them have been nursing the bottle for five, six, ten years. Wean them. Now, babies are cute when they're a year old. When they say, da, da, about six months old, that is beautiful. And when they pop that pot of fire and they're only about a year old, that's cute. But when they're ten years old and they're saying, da, da, and they're popping a pot of fire, it's not cute. They need to grow. And old ministers, pastors, bring those people to maturity. If we really believe that there is a revival coming, then we have got to make preparation for it. And it's not people just to get them to fill a pew. It's to get them ready for the revival that God's going to send. You see, empty pews are not a reason for revival. Big bills with the middle income in a church is not a reason for revival. Lonesomeness is not a reason for revival. But a lost world that doesn't know the Savior, that's the cause of revival. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former house. In the 1700s, there was a tremendous awakening. Now, some of you may question, was this a revival? All I know is people prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. They separated from sin. They gave glory to God. I don't know how much they knew about this beautiful message. I can't blame them for not knowing. I just thank God that I do know. I really do. But there were some real awakenings. When Jonathan Edwards, and they said when he wrote that sinners in the hands of an angry God, his eyes were bad, and he held, held a candle up, and he read it. He read his message, sinners in the hands of an angry God with a candlelight. And when he was done, people were laying on the floor. So they said men had their arms wrapped around pillars, cry, pillars of the church, crying like babies. And they just cry there, and all at once they'd drop in the floor and sob and cry out to God for mercy. I'd like to see some of that in my ministry. I'd like to see some of that. They said George Whitefield came along, a young man again out of Yale, said when he preached it was like sticking a hot pitchfork in hot water. It was searing. He preached to the sinners and sinners repented. They cried out for sin. Amen. That's what I want to see. We preach, sinner, get rid of your sin. But when God moves, they'll cry out, oh God, take my sin away. Praise God. People were seized with the jerks under George Whitefield. Can you imagine? You say, why did they jerk? I think I know. We dance. We've been in this a long time. We run. We dance. But I remember when I got the Holy Ghost, I was only 14. You know what I did? I jerked. I sure did. I wasn't about to run. I wasn't about to roll. But I jerked. I believe it was the Holy Ghost jerking. <laughs> Praise God. People were seized with the jerks. Praise God. I'd like to see God make everybody seized with the jerks. Start with me. James McCready started in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And when he first preached, there were 20 people present. But by the time he was done preaching, after a few weeks, there were 20,000 at one meeting, 800 people were struck down on the floor and laid there for 10 hours. I'm going to tell you something. When God gets ready to do something, He can do it. But let me tell you something else. This didn't just float in. If you want to read the history of it, you're going to read the history where people put calluses on their knees and they prayed. 
And they prayed. And they prayed. And they prayed. They shut everything away but God. That was the only reason they had for living. They said when these 800 were struck down, they cried out, and it was like the roar of Niagara. Somebody described it like a thousand cannons going off at one time when they begin to cry out to God. Peter Cartwright said, I saw 500 of them jerking at the same time. Praise God. Oh, praise God. Praise God. In the 1800s, Charles Finney came on the scene. He was an attorney. And he was trying to live for God in his own little meager way. And one day he went into the back room of his law office and he shut the door and he got on his face and he committed, really committed his life to God. God, for what you want, that's what I'll give. You know, we have to be careful. We reserve a portion of our life for ourselves. And we give God, we say, the first fruits, and then we keep the rest. But when it comes to our life, He wants it all. Amen. Charles Finney said, while I was praying there, there was waves of liquid love that swept over me. He said, it was like a hot searing flame. He said, it was like immense wings that fanned me. Said I, I had never, never felt anything like that before. It was like electricity that went through my body. And when he came out from that audience that he had had with God, he was ready to do the will of God and to preach what he knew about the Lord. He preached in Rome, New York. New York has seen some real awakenings in times past. They've broken the Mohawk River to have baptisms before. But when he preached in Rome, New York, people started to repent. I mean, they started everywhere to repent. There was a sheriff that came to town, and uh, he was going to do some business in one of the hotels. When he crossed the uh, city limits, conviction got hold of him. Here's this old tough sheriff, and he starts to weep. He's crying. He goes to the hotel, but he can't face the guy he's supposed to talk to. He stands over by the window, and he looks out, and he's crying. Conviction got him. He didn't even hear a sermon. Nobody witnessed to him. There's an atmosphere of prayer. It said that you could walk up and down the streets of Rome, New York, any time of the day or night, and you would hear people praying. You'd hear them praying. You'd hear them praying day or night. They were praying. And people cross the city limits and get under conviction. Finally, that old sheriff just fell down and repented and said, God, forgive me of my sins. There was a doctor, this little nine-year-old girl, said, Daddy, I want to get saved. And he said, well, you're, you're too young. God wouldn't, he wouldn't bother with you. And he got in his buggy and drove down the street. And all at once, that same spirit of conviction came down on him. And he started to cry. He started to shake. He turned his horse around, went back home. He said, daughter, that was the Spirit of God. We're going to give our life to God. You see, I'm talking about revival, evangelism. We work. We teach Bible studies. But oh, friend, when God does a sovereign act, when the real outpouring comes, He can go beyond anything that we've ever done or anything that we have ever dreamed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 20 days, 500 people repented in 20 days. Let me ask you a question. What would you do if a thousand people in your city repented, got baptized in Jesus' name, and got the baptism of the Holy Ghost? What would you do? We don't have the base to take care of them. So if we're going to believe what we say, then we've got to get that base. And when we're reaching out to the lost, we're not just building a pew, but God, we're building a base for evangelism. We're building disciples so we can reach our world. Jesus did not build a church. Three and a half years he preached. And he never left a building. He never left any money in the bank. He never left any property that was purchased for a building. There was nothing visible in existence of the church at the time that Jesus ascended on high. It could have been. When he fed 5,000, he could have joined members. When he fed 4,000, he could have joined members, but he never gave an altar call. He never asked anybody outside the disciples to join his group. He could have had multitudes. 
He could have sent the disciples ahead and tell them, I'm going to be there at a certain time, a certain place. And friend, they would have packed it out. But he didn't. He sought for the solitude. He sought for the lonely places. He tried to get away from the crowd. You know why? He was trying to build a base for revival. That's really what he was doing. And that base was 11 men that knew what to do. That knew what to do. Praise God. And then the seeds were sown in a lot of other hearts. The 70 had been out. The 12 had been out. Jesus had taught in the synagogues and the marketplaces and the temple. The seeds had been sown. And when the church was born into existence, there were a group of disciples that knew exactly what to do. Praise God. New York City started with a little old prayer meeting and nobody came until the banks closed. And then there were 10,000 people praying at one time. God... Would you do that again? Would you do that in Rome? We have a church in Rome? Not yet. Antwerp? That church in Antwerp, New York? These were two of the places that Benny had revived. Benny said when he, when he preached, said if he had, they started to fall out. And he said if I'd have had a sword in both hands and been coming at them with both hands swinging, he said I couldn't have cut them down as fast as they fell. And you know what they did? They didn't, they didn't say, oh, do I have to give up this? You, no, sir. God, cleanse me. Cleanse me. Save me. The wrath of God is on me. I'm a sinner. Deliver me, Lord, and forgive my sins. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sailors sailed into the harbor of New York City. And conviction got on them and they'd fall down by the rail and start to weep and didn't even know why they were weeping. And then Evan Roberts prayed that revival in in Wales. They said he only preached about eight months, but he was sitting back on a pew in a meeting and God struck him down and he fell out in the aisle and laid there for a long time. He said when he got up, he was never the same. He started to pray, and he started to pray. In two years' time, 180,000 men in two years' time repented. God, you won't do that for Evan Roberts and not do it for us. Amen. In two years' time, the saloons would close, the dance halls close. Sin was closed, and 180,000 men in two years. And this man only preached for eight months. We're asking for revival. That revival is a pearl. Let me call it the pearl of great price. You can't have it without buying the field. You've got to take what comes with it. Whatever comes with it. God, if you've got to take what I've got, I want in that revival. <laughs> If you've got to afflict me, I want in that revival. If you've got to get my attention by desperate and drastic means, I want in that revival. I've lived my life this long. I've got to be in it. <laughs> Some of you may be thinking, well, you know, preacher, you know, we've been around here a long time and you can't put new wine in old bottles because that's what the Bible says. And that is what the Bible says. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't put new wine in old bottles. You just got to rework those bottles. I found out recently that you can take those bottles. Now, when you say bottles, they're, they're goat skins. And they get dry after a while. But you can, they're tied at the neck and the feet. And they look pretty odd when they're on the camel. And these Arabs are taken through the desert. But that's, that's their wine skins. And they expand when that wine ferments. And that's why I said you can't put it in old bottles. But you can take those wine scans and you soak them in water for two weeks. And that starts to get pliable again. And then when you take it out and you start to rub in the oil, take the olive oil, and you rub it in, and it replaces the water, and it never really dries out. You just squeeze the water out with the olive oil. And when you're done rubbing that wine skin, you can put new wine back in it. It has been reconditioned. Now, God, if you've got an old skin here, recondition me. Amen. Let the waters cleanse. 
Let the cleansing of the washing of the water by the Word be effected in my life. Praise God. Let the washing of regeneration take place in our midst. And let the oil of the Holy Ghost be permeated in my life and yours. Hallelujah. 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 And one more promise I'm waiting on. Matthew 24 and 14. And the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. He said it, Brother Mitchell. It hasn't happened. He said it. It hasn't happened. And then shall the end come. I've got to believe this. I couldn't keep my sanity with a lost world like it is, knowing we, our efforts are so feeble. With all that we do, we're just scratching the surface. We've got to have the special dispensation of the Holy Ghost. We've got to have God's sovereign act. We put our life in it, our time in it, our love in it, our substance. We have gone as far as we can go. And then God has got to do His sovereign act. But when He does, He's going to need disciples to help Him disciple the converts. If this message has been a blessing to you today, please pass it along to someone else or simply tell them about PreachItAudio.com. If you would like to find a Spirit-filled church where lives are transformed in your area, I encourage you to email us today at churches at PreachItAudio.com. Let us know the city and state you live in, and we will reply back to you very quickly to direct you to the church in your area where you will receive the strength you need for your life today, and where you too can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, the only one who could ever save.